five. It's come your catchphrase, Bruce. <laughs> <laughs> come your catchphrase, Bruce. Yeah, that's uh, no, it's my catchphrase. <laughs> okay, let's get going then. Um, thanks for joining us again. This is the fourth Totally Unscripted. And this week we are absolutely totally unscripted. So we'll have to see how this works out. Um, so today what we've got for you is we've got some news that's going to come up from uh, from Martin and I think Spencer's going to do a, a quick demo of, of, of a nice new thing that's come out. Um, we've got Steve, Steve Webster, who's going to follow up on the monetization that we did, I think in the last session. He's had some feedback from some people he'd like to share with you. And then we've got uh, a brand new presenter, Bjorn, thank you for joining us, who's going to talk about how to materialize, let's use the, let's to use the uh, material framework for add-ons. And then if there's any time left, I'm going to have a go at doing some live coding, but we'll have to see how that works out. So let's get started and over to you, Mom. Thanks, Bruce. Well, in terms of news, we're kind of um, trolling through various wires and feeds and there ain't a huge amount <laughs> to the point of we can give you an update on error service, which is there is no update on error service. It still exists in the console. It still doesn't have any documentation. So we wait with beta breath to see if that one comes out. But um, something that hasn't come out from Google, but seems to have um, caught a lot of people's attention uh, in the Google Plus community is a, a new Chrome extension, which allows you to integrate um, your Google Apps Scripts projects into GitHub. And there's been, uh, there's various ways, previous bits of projects, you know, Bruce has got his gasket uh, library that helps you do this. Um, but the, the Chrome extension looks like a nice addition to the options. So I think give us a two minute demonstration of this. Yeah, really quick, two minutes. <laughs> All right, so this was posted on the on the uh, the community a couple days back. And let me uh, share my screen here. All right, so if you go to the uh, Chrome store, um, the extension is called Google Apps Script GitHub Assistant. You add it direct, you know, you install it right from here. And now, whenever you get to, uh, you go inside one of your uh, projects inside the IDE, you have these new buttons right here. Repository, branch, push, and pull. Um, it's a very basic connector to uh, be able to push and pull code directly to and from GitHub. Um, so for example, I have this uh, little uh, this little project right here that I have. I can come repository. All right, so I can call this weather gadget. So now I've created a new repo. There's a new repo that's been created called weather gadget. And I could take this, I can click push. It's push code to GitHub. And it's going to show me um, the diff, the, the difference between what's on GitHub currently and what I have on my side. And since it's a new, it's the initial commit, there is, uh, it's, it's all green, meaning that um, everything's new. So I'll call this the uh, initial commit. You can, it'll show shows that I it has all the files from my project here queued up, and I can say uh, push. And it says successfully push to master of uh, weather gadget, and that's the master is the the master branch. So it does support branch development, which is pretty neat. And then I can come over to my uh, GitHub repo, my GitHub page, and I can see that I now have thirty two repositories with a brand new one here saying uh, Weather Gadget. And here it is, here's my project. It's generate, it gives me a blank readme and uh, all my code is now here on GitHub. It's a very simple, very seamless way of getting code from and to GitHub. And I thought it was, it was so 
nicely done that uh, it was worth sharing. <laughs> no, I Thanks definitely used that last night. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it's great. Um, I, there's such a curve on GitHub, and I think this you know kind of lowers the level for people to yeah. have a backup of their code, um, be able to share their code, get people to, I suppose as well, um, you know, improve the code as well. And they, you know, they can fork something. They can. They're, they're, you know, you can do collaboration. They, you know, because you don't have uh, all the the deep commands that you usually get with Git. You know. Uh, such as you know conflict resolutions and stuff like that. Um, you know if you have some if you have some conflict, this tool you're not going to be able to fix that through this tool. You're going to have to yeah. you know work through uh, the command line if you have to you know resolve conflicts between uh, different forks if you're trying to do a, a push request and and merge. Um, but that's you know this is enough to get your code up there and to pull it down and. And uh, from there, you can learn Git and uh, learn to do all the deep stuff that most people are scared of. But for mm -hmm. this extension, it's very simple, very easy to use, and it works as uh, intended. Um, actually, I can sorry. actually ask about that. Um, if I remember correctly, GitHub can actually be one of the repositories to put up CSS files and stuff like that, right? Um, yeah, they do have it. They they do have. Um, so GitHub hosting pages on their site. Yeah. yeah, go GitHub pages has has hosting on there. Um, that's this will push it to a different spot. Well, ah, this okay. you can push it up there, and then you can go to the pages settings, go under settings, and convert that to uh, GitHub pages, and you should be able to get a static link from there. Okay, that might be a useful thing for us to follow up next next time, Spencer. Just in terms of you know hosting resources on on GitHub using GitHub pages. Okay. Yeah. It we'll, would we'll see. See. See if there's positive noises for that. <laughs> but um, the GitHub is free as well. So, um, uh, well, they they have a free tier, so um, there's no cost there. Yeah. So, and uh, I like to point out, it was um, on the surface this t this tool only works with public repositories, but if you know GitHub enough, you can actually go in and and set it so it'll work with private repositories. So that's cool. my two minutes right there. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I threw the timer up. I did too many demo slams <laughs> in my career. So um, we've got a another. So as Bruce mentioned, we've got a follow up from um, Steve Webster on the the monetization stuff he did last month. So if you haven't watched that, it's uh, available on our YouTube channel. Um, but um, over to you, Steve. What what's um, kind of the reaction been to to the, that initial broadcast? Thank you, Martin. Yeah, we had some good feedback, so I just have a little presentation of a slideshow here. I'm going to share uh, someone's testimony of having a free add-on. Then they went to a paid uh, plan for everyone, and I'm going to go over that little testimony. And then I want to have a brief. Uh, continue to the conversation of how to handle uh, editor collabor collaborators with payments because it could get messy, right? You could be the owner of a spreadsheet and if you are sharing that spreadsheet and you have to refund an account, who's, who's it going to? So we'll talk about that with a quick demo. And then we also have a couple contributions. Uh, Stripe web app code is available thanks to Alan Wells, and we'll share this uh, link uh, after the episode. As well as Bruce, he has shared uh, using Stripe with Promises, which is a, uh, an improvement based on the sample code that I gave. And we'll share that link as well. So let's just go into the, uh, the testimony and my demo. All right, um, this person didn't want to reveal their add-on due to potential competition. So I'm trying to protect the innocent, if you don't mind. Um, so let me just read this as you can read along. Uh, he said, for a long time, we offered everything for free. And even after introducing a paid version, most features remained free. Recently, we removed most features from the free version, essentially forcing many users to get a paid plan. Despite this bait and switch, we didn't get much user backlash. 
as we explained why we needed to do this and offered a long transition period and discounted pricing. So let me interrupt by saying he was very sensitive to the customer, right? So I think that was uh, handled that very well. He continues, we now offer a free trial with full functionality for 30 days, and then they have like a pro version with most features for certain dollars per month. And they actually have another level with even more features with more dollars per month. Or the user can continue for free, but losing most of the features. We're doing the payments on our own site instead of within the add-on itself. And, off and they're offering both Stripe for credit card usage or PayPal if they want to pay from their PayPal balance. Buyers can choose an auto-renewing subscription or a one-time payment. We display pricing in either United States or Euros, depending on the user location. And finally, he says our sales of the add-on are now above $100,000 and growing on average 8% every month. Our expenses are low because we don't need to do any paid marketing. People find the add-on via the add-on store and word of mouth. So our profit margin is really high. And he continued to say that based on this experience, he went from doing it himself to a small team. So it is possible to um, handle, to go from free to pay and grow your little business. So I think that's fantastic. And then to wrap up this uh, feedback, I just wanted to uh, mention something. Um, let's use a, an example. Uh, one of the add-ons that I have with a partner of mine is TextG Blaster SMS texting. And we have a frequently asked question that says, where's my money? And we state, account balances follow the owner of the spreadsheet. If you purchase using a spreadsheet you own, you will get the credits. If you share the spreadsheet with someone else and they buy more credits using that same spreadsheet that you own, then the credits will go to your account, which is actually great for delegating, you know, for like businesses. But don't worry, they will first get a notification explaining this fact if we detect they are not the spreadsheet owner. So I just want to give a quick demo and then we'll wrap this up. So let me enlarge my screen here. So here's TextG Blaster add-on. So right now there is the remaining messages is zero, so it's time to refund on the next usage. So they click preview. They see what's about to be sent, right? If they click next, they have to have payment. But since I'm an editor of the spreadsheet and I'm not the owner, we want to make it perfectly clear that if they hit the buy and they pay with their credit card, it's not credited to their email account, but the email account that is the owner of the spreadsheet. So the point is you could uh, receive payment and assign it to like the say user properties. But if you do that, any collaborators uh, won't have their balance. But if you choose to do it on a document basis level, then it's possible to share someone else's purchases. So it just depends on how you want to do it. Okay, and that is it. So I, I suppose the, um, the immediate question that springs to mind um, is, so how, how are you storing that data? So are you using uh, the property services or for that particular aspect, is there a, a back-end database? Yeah. Um, for the uh, texting add-on that we have, we are using um, a database, in this case a spreadsheet. And so when someone installs the add-on, we uh, get their user email address. And we assign, like in this case, 50 free credits. So it's the owner of that spreadsheet. But if they share that spreadsheet with someone else, uh, they can still use from that person's purchase. So it's true collaboration, right? So that's how we handle it. But well, it's it's um it's fantastic to see um, you can make money from add-ons even though that Google haven't yeah. got 
they keep talking about monetization, mm -hmm. you know, built in, but um, people have gone off and done their own thing. And they, I suppose if you've got the good product, people will pay for it. That's right. Well, it's a nice um, segue into to um, Bjorn, um, <laughs> primarily because he's a GitHub expert. And, oh, no. yeah. <laughs> As I'm sending out an email to you guys last night, saying, um, how can I post this publicly? <laughs> so I think we are discovering GitHub has quite a curve. Um, but um, yeah, um, I think um, Spencer's going to catch up with Rudy on that one, and we'll we'll save Bjorn's expertise on GitHub for now and talk about his expertise <laughs> within um, materializing um, his app script project. So welcome to the show, Bjorn, and um, let's see what you got. Oh, God, my expertise is on keeping it as simple as possible and me do the least amount of work. So <laughs> that's kind Sounds of where I... <laughs> hey, um, I know we had a great conversation before we went even on air about, you know, just um, UIs for all these add-ons. And I think several of you mentioned, I mean, I think Choice Eliminator, which is my popular add-on, the actual code to remove the choice is probably like 25 lines. And then I gotta have another 2,000 lines that are just dedicated to UI. <laughs> so I think a lot of developers are finding that, and especially these beginner, beginner ones, because I mean, I have a full-time job at school, so it's this is my I build something when it's needed. Um, so in my laziness, I, when I was redoing uh, Choice Eliminator, I wanted to like streamline my uh, UI building, and I also kind of wanted to since I was it's a form add-on, and that's just after forms came out with. Um, in the material design, I really wanted to play with that and learn about it. So I found a couple, so you start the research and you find that there's something called frameworks, which is great. It really helps out. Some of them are more complete than others. Uh, I think Google has Angular, which is, I think, their own repository, and that's incredibly powerful. And if you're a copy and paste, um, programmer like I actually am, um, it can be cumbersome. So I kept looking around, and the other thing that happened around that same time was uh, Google had taken away the hosting. <laughs> so I needed to find a solution that I was hoping to find a solution that was um, uh, yeah, hosted its own CSS and JSS, JS files. So what I came up with is I actually found a, something called uh, Materialize. Let me kind of share my screen now, hopefully transitioning into that. And what Materialize is, is just basically framework. So if you're looking down here, there's a form section, and under the form section, it has input fields, and they're really nicely formatted. I mean, I, I know for myself, I wouldn't be able to add these elements in. If I had to build the CSS for this, it would take me forever. Um, and I know this is probably not the practice that Google wants us to do yet, since they're still, they still have their CSS guidelines, and uh, I just completely ignored them and went with this. And I've published an add-on with this, ignoring their I, uh, ignoring their set up so um, so just to kind of show you what it might look like and what you can kind of do with this pretty simply is I created some templates um, this materialized CSS is actually roughly what I have for my choice eliminator where I have some things that can pop down and up uh, depending on the questions and I have choices up there but something I found out really helpful is that material design, while I think it's actually ugly, it's great for the programmer. <laughs> and it allows us to bring in elements like the side menus that are hidden. So it allows us to bring more elements into the, um, the add-on, even though we have a really small area to work with. 
So I thought I'd just kind of show off some of the tools that I've been using and how it works and looking at the code. Um, starting off with actually a blank dialog. So one of the things that I also found when I was doing these is a lot of people wanted like a header for putting information and a footer for putting information and scrolling in the middle. I don't know about you guys, but it took me forever to get that. <laughs> And I finally found one that works. And um, this is posted on GitHub. I was able to get that this morning. And I can post the link, but there it's uh, edlisten slash tu4. <laughs> uh, we'll have all these, and I'll probably be playing with that extension a little bit more. But just to kind of start off with getting in there, um, under Materialize Getting Started, they provided their own um, compiled versions. So I just grabbed theirs that they host on their website. I'm assuming they're going to keep them up to date, and I can just switch the version number if they ever have different versions. So I added those in. So I added the style sheet for Materialize. I actually added the style sheet for um, Google's fonts and icons, uh, which I will show later, which I think is another great resource. Uh, I did notice that add-ons themselves have some issues with certain CSS, uh, namely will change. Is a, If you have a will change in an add-on, it adds this bar on the side. And you can't see it, but I'm raising my hand up and down <laughs> as we're doing this. Um, but right here, the body, header, footer, and the top margin. So all my scripts now have this as a base where I keep a header, a main area, and a footer. And I've gotten it down, so all I have to do is just put the, P at the pixels that they are going to stay on the top and bottom. So that's a good starting point and a great UI tool in there. Um, and there's a bunch of other stuff you can put in there, like different borders and whatnot. But for the most part, I've got it broken out for there. So that's something that I encourage people to, uh, you know, take from my, take from the scripts. Um, I'm a jQuery fan, so I'm familiar with that most, so I did add jQuery in there and materialize. Um, so that's how I started off all my scripts now. Kind of moving forward with that is some other elements that we can use with it. I mean, there's a blank dialog. That sidebar nav that we have that I put up there, where you can just kind of pull out. And it gives you a great way to um, set up different things. Mm -hmm. So with this, I have it being able to switch between windows. So now, yeah, you can also have external links, such as, I mean, I have an external link to my donor page, which is just basically the PayPal page. Um, you can have it open up dialogues in the background and even a new sidebar can kind of go back to it. So how did I do that? I thought that was a good place to start. So in the repository here, they have several different places that we can play with. I think the sidebar nav is under JavaScript. Yeah, it's under JavaScript. So what's nice is it gives me the little window. It gives me a demo of what it can look like. It gives me the code that I can play with. And in this case, it does have an initialization. So I do have to add some stuff to the, uh, to the JavaScript end of things and some options and 
other variations. It looks like they can be pulled as a drop down. So to get this to work, I've had to add this element right here, which is the uh, initialization for it. Um, I added a section for navigation. So this is actually my full on navigation where I have to slide out, and it's just different lines. And I have um, uh, hyperlinks with basically on click, it goes to whatever function I have running up above. So I have a, a show hide for different sections of my script. Uh, I also use the material design icons right here. These are a lot of fun. So Google. Uh, once you have those in here, uh, this is another material design icons that we have. If you look, there are tons of ones that you can search through. And you can even search um, up above and a filter down. What's nice is that once you click on it, all you need to do is actually just change the wording right here. So I have a class, Icon Materials, Play Arrow. If I just wanted to change this to play arrow, I just change this word to play arrow and it will work. And that shows up. These little icons right there. So it really gives you another layer that you can work with. So once I've built my menu, all the navs here, some dividers, um, plain old HTML there. Took me a little bit to remember how I got it to work, <laughs> but in my header section, I had to do call this one part. Um, and what it does is it's basically calling, that creates a link to call to that um, nav bar to open up. Um, it does use the material design icons. So right here, I have the material design icon for menu. Uh, and programmably, one of the tools that I actually did is this little menu icon also works great as a spinner. So if my uh, add-on was doing something, a lot of times I would take the menu icon and just have it spin until the process was done. Um, and I thought that was a kind of a cool little trick you could pull for the menu icon. So adding that in there, um, adding the link, adding the navigation allowed me to create the slide out nav. And I'm just using to switch between views here, between the Wiley Coyote and the Roadrunner. Under my main section, I just have a Coyote section and a Roadrunner section. Right now, the Roadrunner has just displayed none, so it's not showing up. And the functions that I'm running, it's either show Coyote or show Roadrunner, is just hiding and showing those. I forget the actual term. This is what you get for being a copy and paste <laughs> programmer. But I thought that was one of the nicest menu options for getting links out there. Um, other tools out of there. I mean, there's some nice carousels that we can add to uh, to your uh, add-ons. And like I said, the code for this is very minimal. So being able to create really nice um, flip-throughs, this is this code right up here plus one initialization. Um, collapsible, being able to bring things in and out. Our other ones I've used, dialogues, drop downs. Um, under the components, this is where you can have the different buttons floating. Uh, and a lot of times that nice little floating out one where you roll over and it pulls out. That one wasn't very hard 
to implement either. So under, I think, form, I have this pull out. And if I go look at the form section in here, I there is no in initialization that's needed for this one uh, unless you dynamically add some of these tools. Sometimes they'll have, have you gone on. But coming right down to the bottom, all I did was take this one little bit of code and for time, I all I did was actually just kind of copy and paste this one block, pasting it in. Um, now it gives me the items I can add to. I can, like I said, take links. I can link them to other functions within my add-on. So those are two very good space-saving tools. Spencer, are you going to stay awake there? <laughs> Sorry, my eyes aren't good, so I'm just kind of squinting. I'm the one that was up all night. Thanks, compliments of my wife coming home at 2 a.m. in the morning from a conference. So, <laughs> but yeah, and some of the other ones that I did is um, playing with the containers. I thought this was nice, where I, just by adding a div statement saying it's an inside a container, I already gave it with some nice preloaded. Um, Margins. Uh, what else is in there? That's a lot of fun. Uh, columns and rows. This took me a little while to kind of understand is that in material design, or I guess at least in this version of material design, um, materialize uh, grid. Is it grid? Yeah. It breaks where you want to put things up, not into tables like we might be used to. It actually breaks it up into 12 columns, <laughs> 12 physical spaces. And the reason they do this is once you kind of start really getting into this, come on, where's this? It allows for columns within uh, basically it's added responsive design for mobile events and in terms of add-ons the sidebar is a very good mobile size <laughs> versus the dialog which is more computer size so this really helps with the responsive design in terms of setting things where you want them to show up and what it's going to look like So in this one, as you can see, it's 12 columns if it's on a full width. On mobile, I think it's going to show like the first six. That's why I guess the M6 is. So you have the ability to specify how many columns they're showing, which ones are showing up there. But I have my little thing here that says, you know, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 12, one, and these blocks for setting different sizes. So where is rows and columns? So rows and columns here. This is my first block. Um, I have it as a row right here. Chose the background to be teal because setting up the color, they have a color usage chart right here. You basically pick a color and then pick a shade for almost any one of their elements. You just type the word teal under the class and then the shade that you want it to be. So I have purple here, teal here. Um, you have different, you have rows and columns. So you build your uh, format using these rows and columns. Uh, the first one I said, you know, S1, S1, S1 means space one, space one. The second one that I have right here. Uh, the first one I said was using one space. The second one is actually S2, means it's using two spaces. Third one is using three spaces. 
And you can kind of see that where it's using one space, it's using two, two of the spaces, three of the spaces, four of the spaces, um, all the way up to 12. You can offset, offset things, um, and it doesn't matter the content that you put in here. So the hover panel that I have down here uh, looks just to be a container. Um, aligning things is, again, using different classes. So instead of building your own version of CSS and figuring out where it goes up there, they've already pre-built a lot of those. So all you have to do is just add the different terms right inside um, the different classes of either containers or right inside the div statements. Again, what it does is it allows you to create some really cool design elements right within a um, with minimal coding and minimal work on the developers end of things. So all those developers who hate who can build the little functionality but hate building the UI? Well, first of all, raise your hand if you're one of those developers. <laughs> yeah, I figured I'd at least get Spencer there. Um, is uh, really, yeah, it's easy. Um, the only other one I want to just kind of show off that I found that kind of goes along really well with our GitHub um, repository notions is this FAQ that I kind of built with change log and roadmaps and everything else. Uh, one of the things I found is trying to get the information out to my end users about change logs and new information, I'd never, it became hard, it's hard to hard code that information into your, um, into your application. So you either have a tendency to make it completely separate on a different website, or you have it hard coded into your add-on. Uh, what this actually is, is using some of the elements that I had um, found with materialize. See, there's the opening and closing. And I'm actually, it pulls it straight from a spreadsheet. So I keep this one spreadsheet, and it doesn't matter how many little tabs I have down on the bottom. If I add one more, and keep a title and description title for and some smiley faces. When I go to my add-on here and load this up, sheet six, TU four, it automatically pulls it from the spreadsheet. So really, again, another design element, easy to update for the developer, um, pulls it in, and the code for that one, here's my FAQ code. This one I launch a little bit different. I actually launch it as a, where is it? Where'd it go? Right here. Um, oh, I'm forgetting the word. <laughs> As a, I think the templated one where it can use embedded information. So I just grab all the information from the sheet, uh, launch my dialogue with sending in, sending over the HTML data. And then inside my function, when I build, what I do is I use that data and I build the rows, and I build the columns, and I build the sizes that I want it to be, and the content that is put into it. So I use the collapsible pop-outs and the accordions, 
and so I dynamically have created it all. And the only thing in my HTML that I have that puts it is this one little div statement that says this is where my content's going to go. So, well, not even 90 lines of code to build really nice updatable elements that look really good to the end user but easy to update for the developer. Um, I mean, I could show more examples, but the idea is it's pretty simple to add to it and play around with. So, any questions, any comments, any add additions? <laughs> We've um, got a question from one of our... So, um, and I had to check this out myself. In the Google Apps Script documentation, it says, um, uh, to maintain the styles of Google editors, please avoid using material design or polymer elements in your uh, add-ons. Uh, and I just wondered if you got any pushback from the add-on review process about using material design. Actually, not so much. Um, I revamped an add-on that was already published. So Choice Eliminator was already published right. with the old design elements. But what I did do after the fact is I created a light version. And I, they gave me a little bit of pushback and saying, hey, this doesn't work, look like it's supposed to. But I said, you know, it's the light version of something that's already published. And they let it go through fine. I mean, I didn't get, I actually, yeah, I was surprised. I was expecting a lot more pushback um, with it. I'm hoping that as long as it looks good, they seem to be okay with it. Uh, and it, I think using the frameworks really does help get your add-ons the way they should be. And just the space saving and things like that. I mean, there we were. I was using uh, jQuery UI before that. They didn't really have that much problem with jQuery UI either because it added those nice elements and looked professional. So. Well, I was just going to interrupt by saying uh, when Forms was redone using material design natively by Google, it makes sense to me to have an add-on that's also using mm -hmm. material design. Now, if you're using a spreadsheet that is not material design, then it, to me that's apples and oranges and we should conform. So that's just my opinion. I agree. Like I said, I started this off on a, on a form add-on right after they launched the new form, so yeah, I wasn't going to make it look like the old one. <laughs> I know, Bruce, you've used a different material, a, a, a CSS style styling um, in your spreadsheet add-ons. Yeah, have, I use um, MUI CSS, which is, it does the same kind of things, but it's a lot, I would say it's a lot less complete. And uh, the, the, the point that was that was brought up was to do with uh, whether or not we should be trying to conform to the design of the spreadsheet or the host document. And I think that's that's right. I think Bjorn has done that by r using material design in things in forms that are actually material design. Uh, on the spreadsheet, I still use the, um, the, the f I would say, the um, components, component design of uh, the add-ons, and I, was, I include the add-on CSS, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I use the material design framework. It's not really a framework, but let's call it that. For a, as the um, to make things quicker to put together, but yet it still comes out looking as if it was a regular add-on. But behind it, I'm using the CSS, uh, MUI CSS, to kind of do the hard work. So eventually, the good thing about that, of course, is that when uh, sheets and docs eventually do become materialized, it's going to be rather easy to convert existing add-ons that have been built that way um, into, you know, the same kind of format as the as the host document. But it's quite it's quite possible to use the mechanisms of the material design frameworks that they provide, but yet make it still look like you're not, which is what I try to do. Okay, so for so you're using 
the add-ons provide the CSS, you know, so for example, things like buttons, there's you know, clear guidance on action buttons and things like that. So with those, you're using the add-on CSS. And then yeah. for other elements, you're you're trying to lay out using the, the MUI CSS. Yeah, I would say that I used it for laying out as opposed to styling. The, st the styling right. that, 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 that it, it comes from the, uh, the add-on CSS, whereas the laying out comes from the, the MUI framework. Yeah, and there's plenty of things. That, I mean, that's why I had the collapsible information. Um, that was something I started in jQuery UI, moved over to materialize. It's not really in the style sheet of that Google provides to us. Um, so it was kind of a gray area, but it really helped out for me producing information. So and like the carousel of, with the images and things like that. So the bu few buttons and text fields, maybe we can keep the same, but there are certainly elements that we can pull to make our add-ons look nicer and easier for us to add those elements to. And, and, and by the way, my last two add-ons went through the review process without any modifications being required. So clearly they're, they're okay with it, you know, in terms of... <laughs> Of, of how it goes through. Um, I think it leads on as well to, you know, the to um, the components that you showed were very basic ones in, in terms of giving a good user experience, you know, things like um, you know, drop downs that have, you know, search capability if you've got lots of options. Um, it, are there particular frameworks or components people are using for those that can be recommended? Um, I was using Materialize. Actually, one of my add-ons, now that I think about it, that I did publish afterward, it's a spreadsheet add-on. Uh, get add-ons. Uh, do, is a spreadsheet one that does use materialize and I didn't get any fight back when I was using it. Am I sharing my computer screen yet? Yeah. So here's one that's using the materialize design that I had there. Um, here's a text field. Um, I have it doing different filters in there. I have it turning on and off different things. So here's an example of something that went through using these design elements that, you know, the text field was not under their guidelines, but it went through. I also think it's a nice material design element that is working with a uh, spreadsheet. So they're getting, I think, they're not as strict about that as <laughs> they may want to be or they say they are, however that goes. With, uh, in terms of other frameworks people are using, is any favorites? You know, we've heard about Bruce's uh, M, M, what was it? M, MUI was it M? CSS. M, MUI CSS. Um, what about you, Steve? You, you know, you've got quite a few add-ons out there. Are you just doing your own CSS, or are you using anything in particular? Um, move like rows, I use what they've recommended. With uh, Text G Blaster, I got crazy. I use jQuery Mobile, which is different. <laughs> and one of the reasons why I went there with that was because uh, uh, Google supports jQuery in general. Yeah. Uh, so I thought, well, I want to use a framework. Maybe I'll just play with that. It's been kind of fun using that. It's very similar. Um, then I'm working on an add-on for a customer, and I'm using the MUI CSS. What's your choice out there? Uh, in the recent, not an add-on project, but a web app project, I was using Semantic UI. So um, that had some nice components to it, like um, steps and uh, uh, 
searchable drop downs. Um, so there's there's a lot of choice. And that one seemed to, you know, I could drop the code into the script editor, so there was no issue. Of, I suppose that's the other thing to bear in mind is where where the stuff is hosted. Um, but in the script editor, I could um, pull it from there. Mm -hmm. well, well, I'm conscious on time. I'll just let's see if anyone else has got any comments or questions for for Bjorn. Okay. I guess not. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, co conscious of time. Um, thank you for everyone who's. Um, joined in for this episode of uh, Totally Unscripted. Thanks for Bjorn um, coming along and sharing um, some of the stuff that he's been doing. I think it's really interesting. I, personally, I find that the you know, the code takes minutes, the UI takes days. Um, so anything we can have that shortcuts it is um, very welcomed. Um, if, like Bjorn, you'd like to come on to the next show and show off something, um, I'll drop a link into the um, uh, to the show with the the Google form, or like Bjorn, you can just um, ping us on Google Plus, and uh, uh, you, you too can be here um, uh, enjoying. Um, thanks again, also to um, Steve for going over some of well, extending some of the monetization conversation. Um, it kind of echoes his his um, first episode on that uh, last month, where he, he he did underline the fact that it was a conversation starting. So perhaps it's a conversation that will continue. Um, thanks also to Spencer for giving us that two minute, <laughs> three minute, <laughs> three and a half minute <laughs> tour of um, um, GitHub extension and. Got a feeling we might be revisiting GitHub again in uh, future episodes. I'd also like to thank Bruce, who had some notes with um, uh, basically on his blog post recently about um, basically having a framework for creating settings for your add ons that you can reuse across add ons. Um, but I'm sure Bruce will be uh, following that up with. Uh, yeah, another blog post, or, or we can pick it up in the next episode. Uh, and I think that's it. Is it. Have I missed anyone or anything out from that, Bruce? No, I think you've done, done a great job, Martin. Well done. Well, I think uh, uh, quite a few of us in this hangout are now going to go for a lie down and uh, <laughs> we snooze. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but thank you. Thank you all for watching, and uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>